Graveyard Shift Written by Mr. Happenstance Performed by Nightmare Narrative I loved working here at night. Rarely any customers, so calm and peaceful. I could almost sleep through it. Almost. It was your typical gas station in the middle of nowhere. Nothing around except me, my wares, and the empty highway under the dark night sky. Occasionally, I might have someone come in at this time. Someone who's just filled up their tank looking for a bite, and perhaps a drink to keep up their energy and endurance for their long journey through the desert. I would say this happened every few weeks or so around this time. They come in, look around a little, come out to the register. I'd bag their stuff and hand them their receipt, and they'd leave. I rarely saw my boss on duty, but I considered him a good friend, and I think the feeling was mutual. I worked here for quite a few years now, and we developed a certain camaraderie. He let me do my job without any micromanaging, and I ran the store largely by myself, a mutually profitable relationship. It was so late that I was beginning to doze off a little. But then I realized that the door had suddenly swung open. Through the door stepped a well-dressed man in a black suit, white shirt, and a white tie. Tall, but not abnormally so. Caucasian, I thought, with black hair and dark, dark eyes. All in all, pretty normal looking, but dressed far more fancily than our usual clientele, and certainly more so than me wearing my standard issue gas station cashier uniform. Now that alone would pique my curiosity. Who comes into a gas station at 3 a.m. dressed like that? Did a wedding or a funeral run late into the night? I was going to ask if he was all right, but then I took a closer look at him and realized that something about him was off. A few things, actually. Even ignoring the fact that he didn't greet or look at me at all, Usually I'll get at least a nod in my direction. As he walked into the store, I noticed first that his limbs, or joints, made strange sounds. Odd creaking and cracking sounds every time he moved his arms or legs, like they kept popping out of their sockets. Or the bones were grinding against each other somehow. His gait was normal enough, though he seemed to be stepping a little slowly, as if he was trying carefully not to step on something. He walked in this way for some time amongst the aisles. I had no idea what he was looking for, if he was even looking for anything. Now, I try not to assume the worst of people, and I internally scolded myself for doing that. He may be a strange man, but that didn't mean he was a bad person. Some people are just different than you and I. Maybe he just liked to dress up in a nice suit and tie, nothing wrong with that. Maybe he had some joint problems or some kind of arthritis. I don't know, I'm not a doctor. Maybe he was used to receiving more than his fair share of odd looks and stares when he went about his business. You know, the old saying about assuming. I cleared my throat and greeted him. <clears throat> Hello, sir. I hope you're having a good night. Is there anything I can help you with? He stopped dead in his tracks. His head, just his head, turned to look at me making a slow 90 degree turn, accompanied by a long creaking noise as it moved. The rest of his body didn't move at all and was no longer moving. He didn't even seem to breathe. That's when I noticed his face. It was off somehow. I don't mean ugly or disfigured, at least not exactly. It could have passed for normal if you weren't looking directly at it. But it seemed to me that his face was a mask one which didn't particularly fit him well. Not a rubbery mask you might find in a Halloween store, you understand. It looked like human skin, but it was crooked somehow. You know what I mean? If you've ever tricked or treated in your Halloween costume, and you were running or something, and your mask slipped down a bit, or went up or to the side on your face, so that your eyes no longer were perfectly behind the eye holes, so you, you couldn't see well anymore. Just a bit crooked. That's how it looked on this man, like his face was slightly askew, like his real face was hiding underneath. It wasn't Halloween though, not even close. 
And if this costume was from some kind of horror movie, I've never heard of it before. So, okay, I thought. Maybe he had some accident when he was younger, which badly disfigured his face. And he wears a false one to cover it up. Quite unusual, but not unheard of. And so, for just a brief moment, I felt some shame again, judging this man I didn't truly know. But when he responded, that's when my justifications for assuming the best of this man had run out. There is something you can help me with. Now, nothing odd about that by itself. The tone of voice wasn't overly creepy or sinister or anything, it was the way he said it. His mouth hadn't moved at all. It was hanging open the entire time, like he was some oversized ventriloquist dummy whose master forgot to make its mouth move. He stared blankly at me, his eyes very slightly obscured by his face. Whether he was going out of his way to mess with me, or whether he was messed up or something himself, I knew now for sure that there was something seriously wrong with this guy. Can, can you say that again, sir? I asked before I knew what I was doing, betraying a hint of nervousness in my own voice. I, I didn't quite catch that. He silently turned his body to match the direction of his head, and he took two steps forward. He directly faced me now, only about 12 feet away between two aisles in this gas station in the middle of nowhere. There is something you can help me with. He said again, pausing with each word. His eyes, I just noticed that he hadn't blinked once. I also noticed, looking closely, that his eyes were just dark. His irises were completely black as if they had been consumed by his pupils. He was now giving me a smile that only could be described as creepy. I hadn't noticed his mouth move into a smile, and I, I still didn't see his mouth moving as he talked. What, what can I help you with, sir? I asked. I felt my cell phone in my pocket, but I knew if something bad happened, that neither my boss nor the police would ever get here in time. I felt my knife in my other pocket. I enjoyed my job and I really liked my boss, but I wasn't going to risk my life to protect all six $20 bills or whatever in the cash register. I was allowed to carry personal protection in case we ever had a situation like this, and my boss told me if I came down to life or the store that I should choose to protect myself, but never in my darkest dreams did I ever think I would have to use my knife on someone. He spoke again though his mouth never moved, his lips neither moving nor fully closed as he talked. I'm a lonely man, very lonely. I have come here so you can give me a hug. All I want is a hug. Will you hug me? I don't know if it was the creepiness of this situation that got to me, or the monotone way he said such an odd thing, or the fact that he spoke like the world's best freaking ventriloquist. I don't know exactly what it was, but I finally snapped. Get the hell away from me, you freak! He blinked a few times. He didn't say or do anything for about five seconds, as if he was processing or trying to understand what I said. But then, he spoke again, no longer smiling, his mouth still agape. Is it store policy that you help the customer, is it not? I am the customer. I want your help. I feel alone and scared. Give me a hug. Now, please. He walked closer now, his legs and arms still creaking and snapping and cracking. He was smiling again. I had never once seen his mouth move. His eyes seemed to have grown darker. They were completely black now. His teeth somehow seemed sharper. Could I be imagining all this? Had the long nights working here got to me at last? I blinked a few times myself and rubbed my eyes. Nope, I wasn't. He was now standing just in front of the counter, not two feet from me. I see you gripping a knife, my friend. He spoke now, his voice completely devoid of any emotion. I don't want to get blood on my nice suit. That would make me cry. 
Suddenly, he made awful crying noises. I saw tears suddenly, uncontrollably, falling from his eyes as he wailed, like it was a program response or something. He did this for 10 seconds, and then stopped as quickly as he had begun. His eyes and cheeks were completely dry. The customer is always right, my friend. Come now, we will hug. Before I could even respond, his arms reached out and grabbed me, lifting me off the ground, taking me over to the cash register which I knocked over with my feet as he brought me to him. He was far, far stronger than he looked. He pulled me into a tight embrace, his arms cracking and snapping. I tried to fight, but I couldn't. He held me almost still. My struggling was futile. I was close enough to clearly hear him breathing, but it was only a sound. He didn't seem to inhale or exhale. You almost did a very bad thing, my friend. You would have ruined my nice suit. I just got it cleaned a few days ago. There must be an apology. Apologize, my friend. He hugged me yet tighter, and I heard new cracking and snapping. My own bones were breaking. Please, please stop, I begged him. Suddenly I gasped. <gasps> I felt a sharp pain in my chest and could no longer breathe at all. I knew somehow that he had punctured my lungs. He was holding my knife in his hand, covered in my blood. He had gotten it from my grip, I didn't know. I didn't even notice he had it until just now. He set it gently on the counter. I stopped as you asked, showing you the courtesy you denied me. This was very disappointing service. I came in here expecting better, very disappointing. He cried his awful, awful cry again, his mouth not moving, tears flooding from his dark eyes. I felt a few drops fall on me as he roughly dropped me. I lay gasping on the floor, my chest covered in blood. At the very least, I am glad that you didn't mess up my nice suit. It would have been a shame if that had happened. It seems the pressure of this job has gotten to you after all, my friend. It is unfortunate that I drove you to take your own life. These stab wounds were self-inflicted. Any coroner would agree with that. A true shame. It is an agonizingly painful way to die, he said in a monotone, his mouth still not moving at all. Despite his monotone, I thought I could now detect a touch of malice and cruel glee in his voice. He went to the door, creaking and cracking, ignoring my choking gasp for air. His head, with a sickening, cracking sound, turned completely backwards towards me in a 180 degree motion like an owl. I must say, all in all, that this was very disappointing service. I asked for one thing which you had, which you refused to provide. You intended to ruin my outfit. You refused to apologize for that. You even insulted me unprovoked. I expect better of this establishment and of you. Very disappointing. He smiled at me, and his black eyes seemed to laugh at me as he held the door open, prepared to go. Very disappointing. I will have to tell your parents, who raised such a rude person, and your boss, who trained you so poorly, and contributed to my poor experience here tonight. Hopefully, they won't disappoint me either, as you have. But at least, my outfit is still clean and unblemished. That is good. It would have been a shame if it had been stained with your blood. He laughed a hollow laugh. His mouth moved for it the first time tonight, making the facsimile of a laughing motion, but with an odd clicking or clacking sound as it did, as if his teeth were hitting each other. He left, but I didn't hear the sound of any engine revving up or a car leaving the station. As I lay, feebly grasping for air, I realized that there was a weight in my hand. I held the knife, covered in my own blood. I looked and I saw my cell phone was on the counter where I thought he had left the knife. I desperately crawled to the counter with my failing strength and realized that it had no charge whatsoever. Great, calling the cops wasn't an option at all. At the very least, I thought as I felt my mind and body shutting down, 
Perhaps the security cameras here will help the police identify my murderer and give my family some closure. But as soon as that thought had crossed my mind, the camera in the upper right portion of the store started smoking and fell to the floor with a crash. The evidence of my murder was now gone. Just when I thought it couldn't get any worse and that perhaps a tape inside the camera could be salvageable, I noticed a fire spreading from the camera to the rest of the store. Within a few seconds, the gas station started to go up in flames. Much, much quicker than fires usually spread, I thought, though at this point I wasn't surprised by anything anymore. As I gasped and coughed from both my stab wound and smoke inhalation, I heard a familiar laughter coming from outside. I slid on my body as best I could, the blood from my chest having soaked through my shirt and making the floor where I was slippery to face the entrance. I saw the man waving, an evil smile on his face. His face, there was something different about it. I realized, with futile fury, that it was my face now. A little crooked, but recognizably mine. Aside from the eyes, which were still completely black. In his other hand, he held something else that was familiar, my keys. The keys to my car and my keys to the store. I hadn't felt them leave my pocket either. I think it is time that you visited your parents and your boss, my friend. They will be relieved to know that you weren't caught in the inferno that will overtake this gas station. Soon, the firefighters and news vans will be here. Unfortunately, the fire will be too severe to fight but they will find, to their immense relief, that it seems no one was caught in it. Or at least, no body will ever be recovered, especially when the flames reach the petroleum outside. It tends to burn very quickly and completely, you may know. It is quite a pity. Aside from being stabbed in the lung, that may be the most agonizing, torturously painful way to die, to burn alive. It will be interesting to see whether the blade or the blaze will ultimately be responsible for taking you. I myself must watch from a distance. I wouldn't want the flames to reach my suit any more than I would want your blood to touch it. It would be a shame if it were ruined after all. But I think your parents and your boss will be quite pleased to see not only you alive, but so impeccably dressed. He smirked again and I realized with horror that my parents and boss would be so relieved to see me alive and safe that they wouldn't ask questions about my strange appearance, mannerisms, or the creaking and cracking noises my body made. They would indeed be relieved to see that I somehow escaped the catastrophe which befell my place of work. The clever bastard knew. He knew it, and I knew what he was going to do, and I was right. He locked the door to the gas station. I was now completely trapped, as smoke and blood had now nearly filled my lungs. The door had been my one feeble hope. I didn't even have the strength to try to break the glass. I slumped down again, still looking at the stranger. He headed over my car now, but said one last thing to me as I gave up fighting to live, which I could just barely hear. All I had left was rage and grief, not just for myself and my own tragic fate, but also for the horror which I knew awaited my parents and my boss. I will tell them of your shortcomings. I will tell them of my disappointment here tonight, and I will give them a hug. Indeed, my friend. And he held up my knife, clean of blood, which I somehow hadn't noticed had disappeared for a final time from my hand as his smile grew wide with malice. They will welcome me with open arms. <laughs>